am excited to have Scott Wingo here. He, uh, Scott and I have become friends over the last couple of years um, since I took on this job, and he's been super helpful to me just in meeting people in the community and just talking through different issues that startups are facing. Um, he's going to kick things off with a little presentation. He um, spoke at the Internet Summit this year. Is any, was anyone else there? Anyone else see it? couple people, and gave a really cool talk about the things he's working on um, post uh, Channel Advisor, although you're still working on Channel Advisor too, but he's the chairman there now. So um, has had M&A experience, went through an IPO almost three years ago, and is doing some really cool things now. So he's going to start off with a little presentation, and then we're going to sit down, do some Q&A. Hopefully all of you ask questions. I have some too, because um, that's what I do, but um, we'll let Scott take it from here. Thanks, Lord. You should tell Michael no one puts Laura in the corner. It's a dirty dancing joke for the for the older people in the audience. Uh, so one question I get a lot is, who the heck is this guy? Uh, so I'm a serial entrepreneur. That means I invent breakfast foods. So if you've had Captain Crunch, you know, uh, other kind of cereal. So uh, I started many companies. Uh, on my fourth one, kind of between three and four right now, uh, and that's given me a ton of experience. So I just wanted to. Uh, share my message. Uh, I'm from a little town called Aiken, South Carolina. Uh, and this is relevant because I spend a lot of time at Google and eBay and I meet these people and they're from Palo Alto. They have Stanford MBAs. They went here. They went Harvard. I'm from Aiken, South Carolina. So uh, this is the middle. It's thoroughbred country. Yes, it's definitely a horse town. And I do not ride horses. So it's like football and horses and I am the one geek in in South Carolina. So that's, that's my existence. That's my, my house. Um, the one thing that was unique about my house is my dad was an entrepreneur, which was very unusual at the time, and we had a vax in my house. So this is an old digital equipment company, you know, thing, and we actually had four of those boxes. Uh, first of all, this is a funny ad. Like, this lady's so happy that the machine's saving her time. She's like kicking off her shoes. Just such a very strange image. <laughs> um, the founder of this company, Ken Olson, famously said, no one will ever want a, desk, a computer on their desktop. That's crazy. Um, so that company's out of business now. Uh, but anyway, so imagine you go in this little house, and there's an office, and it's jam-packed. It has its own air conditioner. That was what I grew up in. It was very strange. So people would come by and be like, what the heck kind of refrigerator is that? You know, it's got like the NASA-style tape reel spinning and kind of stuff. Um, but what my dad did is he invented a carpet system for uh, carpet retailers so that they could measure out the carpet and figure out how to optimize the rolls of carpet. And he ultimately sold it to DuPont. So it was kind of a very weird thing to have happen kind of in the 1970s, which is much more common now. So I, I grew up with entrepreneurship. I was always into computers, but I wasn't really into entrepreneurship until my dad gave me this magazine. So he had Fortune magazine. Uh, and he said, hey, you may want to read this. And he gave it to me. And the first thing that struck me was, uh, for those of you that don't know, this is Bill Gates. Number one, I've said, finally, I've found someone nerdier than I am. Uh, so that was good. Uh, and, but you know, this is interesting. So Bill Gates, 30, and he did a deal that made him $350 million. And what that deal was was the IPO. So this is the first time I'd read about IPOs and the whole process. Uh, this is actually online now. It's really actually a pretty interesting read if you kind of go through. A lot of it's still kind of the same process of IPOs. And I was 17 when I got this, and I said, you know, that'd be pretty cool to do an IPO. I think I want to do that. So I kind of set that as a life goal. Um, then I uh, went to the University of South Carolina, home of the fighting Gamecocks, ass kicking chicken. For those that don't know, I know we've got some people from out of town. A Gamecock is an ass kicking chicken. Uh, and when you say kicking, you don't put a G on there. So ass kicking chicken. So, so it rhymes with chicken. Uh, uh, then I went to NC State for uh, grad school. And what was neat at NC State was, I'm, hooked up with a professor, he's still active, Tom Miller, uh, and he, he started, uh, he had his own side company, so he was an entrepreneurial guy. And I got to this point where I was graduating and I had a job offer from IBM, Motorola, and then this guy I had worked with in an internship offered me a job at a startup where I'd be employed number one. And I went to my professor and he said, do you have a mortgage? And I said, no, I'm a grad student. He said, do you, is your car paid off? And it, you know, I had like a Honda where it was kind of falling apart, but it you know, had 100,000 miles, but it was paid off. He said, you should go do this startup and try that. If it doesn't work, IBM and Motorola will take you back. So even though my dad was a startup, I was a little nervous and did that. Uh, and I worked for a company, and that was a great experience. The only thing that was negative about it was in Connecticut. So uh, this white stuff we're about to get, we got like every day for six months. And being from the South is like just totally depressing. Um, so went to work for a startup uh, in Connecticut for three years, moved back here. 
Um, and uh, so I'm a, I have a computer engineering background, and what we did at Bristol Technology was we helped developers port their apps from Windows to Unix, um, kind of like Linux today. And in the process, I really got involved with this Microsoft class library so called Microsoft Foundation Classes, and it's Visual C++. A lot of you guys are developers, you know what C++ is. So what we found, is, what I found is, is I started to kind of write about it and write articles, and then people would come to me for advice, and then I started to find that people needed stuff around this class library. So moved back here to 1995, started a company called Stingray Software, and we did developer tools for Visual C++. This is a bootstrap, so myself and my partner each put in literally $5,000, that was our startup capital, uh, and then we put an ad in the Microsoft Systems Journal, and we knew it was coming out in three months, so we started coding like crazy so that we had a product to sell in three months. Um, that worked out really well, we scaled it. We got, to, we got to about a $12 million run rate, and what we realized was we had 3,000 customers, and we realized that the, the available market was probably 6,000 customers, so we quickly captured 50% of a very small market. Um, but that was a really good first company for us because selling developers is easy. All you need in your marketing budget is beer and pizza. Uh, and then I also found uh, one of my, I have a very small entrepreneurial playbook, but one of the pages in there is become an expert at something and people will kind of come to you, which is a good marketing kind of thing. Now there's all the, the name for it, the whole uh, out, you know, inbound marketing and all that kind of stuff, but I, I kind of stumbled on that there. Um, we ended up selling that company to a public company called Rogue Wave Software. Uh, and that was a good exit. We took the proceeds of that. At this point, this dude named Mark Andreessen had invented the internet. I was really excited about it. Uh, and we started kind of thinking about internet ideas. And one of the ideas we had was a comparison shopping engine. We said, we'll send out all these bots, we'll find the lowest price and bring it back. We started working on it. And then literally within a week, like five companies raised $200 million to be comparison shopping engines. So we were super depressed. Um, one other fact about me is I'm a huge Star Wars fan. I have a massive Star Wars collection. When I was little, I collected the little things. Now I collect bigger things, uh, uh, life-size stuff. And uh, so at this point, after selling the company, I started buying more Star Wars stuff. And I found I would go to these auction sites. So I'd, I would go to eBay. There was a Star Wars auction site. There was actually an auction site for props and stuff like that. And I said, well, what if we, we pivot on the comparison shopping engine thing and we, we search for auction sites? Now, back then, uh, Auction sites were exploding. You know, everyone was opening an auction site. We even had a local company called OpenSite that had software for building auction sites. So we, we figured that, that that would be interesting. We built it, and I was enamored with this company called GoTo.com. And they were out of Idea Lab in Pasadena, and they invented paid search. So no one actually remembers this because Google made all the money. It's a good case study. GoTo had the idea. And so we said, let's take that business model, this whole pay per click thing, and apply it to our auction search engine. We called that Auction Rover. Uh, and this was like the craziest six months of my life. We literally slept in the office for six months. Um, you know, got, VCs were literally handing me checks and kind of like trying to invest. And it was just totally crazy, kind of the dot-com bubble time frame. Um, anyway, we raised $3 million uh, and we got acquired by GoTo. They really liked the fact we invented their business model. They changed their name to Overture and then they got acquired by Yahoo. Um, and what happened is we had always on the we always wanted two sides of this business, so we we're kind of building a two-sided marketplace. We wanted to have the search engine, but then we wanted to monetize it with sellers that would pay us per click. So after we got acquired, we started working on that seller piece, and it was really interesting. So we had something like thirty thousand users of this seller software, and what the seller software would do is it would help you list on eBay and different auction sites and this kind of thing. And what um, what would happen is. We'd charge $20 a month. These people would call 24 seven and they wanted like Nordstrom service for $20 a month. And they loved to like talk about the most random stuff. So you know, I'd be in the office at 9 p.m. and the customer service rep's like, yeah, yeah, I understand. I was like, what, what's going on? He's like, she's worried about her daughter in college. And I'm like, hang up the phone, <laughs> not our problem. And then we get all these weird, weird feature requests like, you know, I would really like a dancing kitten to be in my auction. Can you guys help me with that? And I'm like, I guess so. Um, so I was kind of sitting there thinking, is there a business here? And we, were, we had been acquired, so I was kind of spending other people's money. And uh, the epiphany that happened that kind of became my next business was, I was we had the whole dot-com bubble burst. And I was looking at some reports, and our previous number one seller was Granny Goose, and she sold like $5,000 a month worth of handmade stuff. The next month, it was Sun Microsystems, and they sold $2 million worth of servers. Now this is when eBay was like 99% Beanie Babies and people were buying Beanie Babies for like $2,000. It was kind of crazy. You know, it's hard to leave bags of sand. Um, uh, but anyway, and so I kind of said, I'm not, you know, again, I'm not a genius. I'm from Aiken, South Carolina. I said, all right, they paid us $20 a month and they made $2 million. We could probably raise our prices a little bit there. 
Um, so what then start, what started happening is Motorola did the same thing and then IBM. What was happening is even though eBay was designed for people to trade with people, there was an audience there and they said, it may be a 0.1% chance, but there's gonna be some IT dude that loves Beanie Babies that's gonna see a server half off and we may sell something. And sure enough, it worked. Um, so we kind of said, that's a really interesting trend. What if all these places that people congregate on the internet become sales channels where they buy things? Maybe they don't intend to start that way, but what if they turn into it? So we went to the CEO of uh, Overture and said, hey, we have this kind of wacky idea. There's a little bit of a Br'er Rabbit thing. Um, you guys could shut it down. It's probably worth zero, but we want to just maybe try something out of there. And at the time, they had Google coming at them and realized there was a bit of a threat there. So they said, okay, this solves a bunch of our problems. So 2001 started Channel Advisor. And what we do at Channel Advisor, so we're, we're cloud-based SaaS, uh, recurring revenue business model. We help retailers sell across different channels online. So eBay, Amazon, we support 47 marketplaces now, Tmall, um, Mercado Libre in Brazil, all these kinds of things. We also help them with comparison shopping engines and whatnot. Um, so imagine, it's kind of like salesforce.com for managing your e-commerce channels if you're a marketer. Um, so we have about 3,000 customers now. We've got all the big guys like Under Armour, Nike, Macy's, Saks, all these kind of folks. Then we also have a huge entrepreneurial kind of group as well. Um, these are always a little bit more interesting and fun to deal with. So like there's these two brothers at Rock Bottom Golf and you go visit them and you know, they're like totally crazy. They've got all these wacky ideas. The golf industry hates these guys because they figured out a way to go buy, you know, Nike, what Nike wants is they want this fancy new golf club to always be $700 everywhere. And what the Raft brothers do is they figure out how to go grab it, move it through six loading docks so Nike can't track it and then sell it for $200. Um, so, uh, so it's kind of an interesting kind of whole thing in the e-commerce landscape. So started Channel Advisor 2001, we raised $90 million and went public in 2013. So I got to ring the bell on the New York Stock Exchange, that's fun. Um, and uh, I'm a huge CNBC junkie, so I got to meet Jim Cramer, and I've actually been uh, on his show several times now. I've pressed the sound buttons. Uh, if you ever watch Mad Money, it has all these kind of fun soundboard and stuff. He's actually quite short. I'm not the tallest guy in the world. Um, and you know, the day we went public, it's really cool to see that on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, how these are the guys buying the stock, and this is Goldman Sachs kind of auctioning off your stock. It's a really cool economics lesson to watch how the price kind of uh, me measures out. So uh, I think it was 27 years after seeing the Fortune article, I was able to check that box of, of going public after kind of several attempts to get there. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is we get, we've gotten a lot of best place to work awards. Um, so I spent a lot of time on company culture. Um, so uh, in last year, in the middle of last year, uh, we got to the point where uh, it's fun to go public, being public's harder. Uh, and I found that I was just kind of spending 80% of my time on stuff that wasn't you know, what I wanted to spend my time on. So investor relations and talking to analysts, all very important and good for the business, but I kind of started to miss working more on the product side and talking to customers. Um, so we had a COO president who was uh, wanting to be CEO, so it worked out really well to kind of have him become CEO and I became executive chairman. Executive chairman is like a fun title because there's no like real definition of it, so I just kind of get to do whatever I want, so that's great. So I'm actually in the opposite spectrum. I just do whatever I want, so it's cool. I spent about half of my time at Channel Advisor, uh, and then I've been doing a couple other things, uh, doing some angel investing. I'm an investor in a Columbia, South Carolina company, not a lot of those, called Zebras, that does 3D e-commerce, which is kind of neat. So they print all this stuff. Uh, it's not like the cheap MakerBot stuff. It's on these high-end machines, uh, and it feels like cement, so it's a, a very good product. Uh, organic Transit down the street, Web Picks over in Raleigh. I uh, just joined the board of Spoonflower and Windsor Circle, and I'm an investor in three local companies and one in uh, invest investment vehicles and one in Boston. Um, the other thing I kind of stumbled into is after I sold my first company, I divested, I started kind of um, uh, invest in some stuff that's not high tech. I have kind of a barbell strategy, it's like super high risk and then super low risk kind of stuff. And uh, I bought two car washes, and I had a friend that said, I've always wanted to run a car wash, and I thought, that sounds like a good investment. I do not uh, launder money, and I don't do crystal meth. That's the, number, the top two questions I get about that. Curse <laughs> uh, Breaking Bad. Uh, and then, uh, so then uh, what happened is we always had this detailing business, and in 2008, it just went away. Um, the recession caused people to kind of really evaluate where they spent time. And as we asked people that were regular customers, they just said, I don't have time for it anymore. 
So we started, uh, we got two vans, we started going to them and we replaced that business. And then I started using Uber very heavily in 2011, 2012. I had the idea, what if we could do this, uh, take those vans and have an app and do more of an on-demand car wash? Uh, and then uh, what happened is I found a Bay Area company called Cherry started and I was going to, instead of us doing it, I watched what happened to them. And they did the whole thing where, uh, like Uber, they did 1099 employees. Uh, it was actually Uber drivers and they would just put like a bucket, literally a bucket and a sponge and, a, and some water in their trunk and they would go wash cars for $20. We looked at that and we said, there's no way that's going to work. And sure enough, six months later, they failed. So in 2014, we, we decided to go ahead and test this. Uh, we rebranded everything as Spiffy uh, and we did the app. and. Uh, what has happened is the demand for this has really taken off. People love the ability from their phone to be able to get a car wash. Um, and we started just kind of simple exteriors at $20 all the way to make my car look brand spanking new for $250. Um, I do have a coupon code for you guys. It's exclusive AU21, and that'll give you $20 off, and that's active for the next 30 days. Uh, so we'd love for you to try it. And, uh, the app is not quite where we want, so we're working on that. Uh, and, but we'd love for you to try the service and let us know how it goes. We have 20 vans and we're in Raleigh and Charlotte um, and uh, we're pausing growth right now because the software is kind of catching up to where the demand is right now. Um, working with Laura, I started doing some articles and uh, from those articles about startup stuff and then a lot of local execs coming into the area, I'm, I'm, I've got a big LinkedIn network, I uh, kind of happen to have one because uh, I know a lot of people in Boston and the Bay Area. So when a lot of execs come to the area, they're like, you know, they linked into me and they say, do you have any ideas of where we could, could go? So I've always kept this little list of companies I knew that were kind of like big enough for a VP of sales from somewhere to work at, but also, you know, not too terribly big. Um, so uh, I said to Laura, hey, I get this request, can we do something? So we did this whole tweener list, uh, which has become very popular. And a tweener is, um, a lot of you aren't quite there yet, but it's kind of above early stage. So the way I kind of have defined it, just to keep the list manageable, is it's an or. So over a million dollars in revenue or 10 people. Um, and what that has done is it created this really nice kind of around 100 list of companies in the triangle that are a good resource for people to look at. Um, we just did the 2016 list, and there's 98 active. Um, and one thing I want to show you guys is I just put them all on a map. Uh, and Raleigh is leading at 48, Durham 30, so come on guys, we need, more, we need 18 AU guys to pop up there. Um, and uh, I've got an interactive map we're going to release here soon, which is kind of cool. I've color-coded it by city, but I also have what sector we're in. So if it's a health tech, a SaaS, MarTech, ad tech, all that kind of stuff. Um, so this is going to be a, a, continue to be a really valuable resource, and it's a lot of fun to work on. I've met a ton of companies from doing this, and a lot of you guys here I have met from this, this activity. So, you know, you know, my conclusion is if I can do it, I'm just like a dude from Aiken, South Carolina that works really hard. Um, you know, I've got no MBA or anything like that. If I can do it, you guys can do it. So, um, looking forward to answering any questions you guys have around uh, any of the, the things I've done or any challenges you face. Thanks. All right, so Scott already answered some, a couple of my, my first questions in his presentation, which is awesome. Um, but, ooh. Okay. <laughs> um, but I wanted to kind of start out um, and just get the ball rolling by asking you a little bit about um, sort of, you've always wanted to do an IPO and you did that. So talk a little bit about how you got the company to the place that you could do that. Yeah, so, um, so, you know, there's these guys called investment bankers, and for those of you that are tweeners, I actually recommend you start meeting with investment bankers uh, because they give you uh, wonderful free uh, you know, resources. So we've, we've always met with investment bankers and said, hey, uh, we're in the sector of software as a service. Um, what's the IPO market look like in the m a market? So they actually have, they come in and you, you ask someone at Goldman Sachs that question, they'll come with like a 200-page deck that's got, you know, like, it had 10 analysts working on it for weeks. So, so that's why I love using them as a free resource. Uh, we never had an analytics function, just kind of ask investment bankers to do it for free. Um, and what they'll tell you is, and, and this is true today, um, the way it works is the people that invest in an IPO are mutual funds, so like Fidelity and people like that, and then hedge funds. And for it to work out, you have to have a market capitalization of kind of 300 million and up, because their problem is, uh, it's a high class problem. You know, if I'm a Fidelity guy, I'm managing $8 billion. Um, and to manage $8 billion, to move the needle, I have to put kind of 30 to $100 million into something. So that, that's kind of what actually builds this whole math up that you have to be, so then, so then if you have to be, call it $500 million, 
uh, market cap, then you know SaaS multiples, the multiples of your revenue are 5x, so you do that, so you need to be kind of at a $100 million kind of a run rate, 80 to $100 million. So, so that's the really big thing is scale, so revenue scale. Um, now that being said, there's always exceptions to these rules. Um, so like biotech companies, they just need FDA approvals, so they have a whole different set. Um, Consumer-oriented products, you know, they, they have had, if they have a big audience, many times they can go public. Um, but for a SaaS recurring revenue business, generally the rule of thumb is 60 to 80 million dollars. Um, so, so we knew that was the goal and we just kind of chugged uh, over there. It's kind of a, you know, a 13 year overnight success story to get there. And did you have acquisition offers in the meantime? We, we did. Um, one of the challenges, and we knew this when we built the Channel Advisor, is because we work with eBay, Amazon, Google kind of equally, um, it takes them off the table as acquisition candidates, oddly enough. Because, um, so let's say we're evenly distributed between eBay, Amazon, uh, and Google. Uh, if Amazon's going to buy you, they're only going to enjoy 30% of the benefit because you're going to have to turn off 60% of the other stuff. Because these guys hate each other, they're not going to, they don't want to buy Switzerland, they want to buy the piece that helps them. So in a way, we almost designed it not to be acquirable by the most likely candidates. Uh, but we always thought that uh, ultimately the big software guys, if they were excited enough about e-commerce, they would look at it. Uh, but they're very enamored with the shopping cart part of e-commerce. They haven't really picked up on our part of e-commerce yet. So you know, TBD, we'll have to see if they ever wake up to that. So um, are there a certain advice that you would have for people when they're thinking about their different acquisition targets from an M&A perspective? I mean, you knew that building your business, you might not have as many you know, potential suitors, right? Yeah. Yeah, and, and what I've done in all my businesses is just really build the business. So I, I do meet with a lot of entrepreneurs that um, maybe overthink the exit, right? So um, spend 90% of your time building the business. You know, if you can build a business that has great customers, growing revenue, uh, and a path to profitability, then you know, then the ex exits will come to you. So that that's step one. You have to do those things. Uh, but then, then what I've done is, like in our first business, we kind of knew Roadway may be an acquisition target, but we, we went at them at a partnership angle first, because we kind of wanted to date before we got married too. So we kind of said, hey, let's do, we think you can distribute our software in Europe, because we were just in the US, and uh, you have all these sales reps, we don't want to hire that many sales reps. And as we get to know them, we really liked working with them, and then ultimately, it kind of helped them get there too, because it proved the point that this could work. So, um, so if you do have a target of an M&A, I would say, get to know them on a partnership basis, um, get to kind of understand the personalities there, because for everyone I've met that I like, I have a lot that you don't like too, and kind of, you know, if their business practices are, the lawyer sends up the thing that has like an 80 page identity, and they just kind of say, F you, that's our, what our lawyers say, then you know, that's a good signal early on that that's probably not gonna be a great company to work for. Are you wearing Gamecock socks? These are uh, BB-8s. Oh. Yeah. Sorry, I'm distracted easily, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> Laura doesn't know Star Wars, I have to. Yeah. Um, I do feel like we need to see like photos of the room where all the- He's a robot, the... he's a robot. Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I couldn't see the robot, I could just see orange. Yeah, so. my kids anyway. gave me these and they're my warmest socks, so I figured today was a good day for me. Okay, cool. Anyone else have questions, please just raise your hand um, and happy to, to take those. So talk a little bit about retail and the industry of retail. You were obviously passionate about Star Wars. Um, how passionate were you about retail or was it more about building the business to solve the problem? Yeah, in the early days, um, you know, so, so e-commerce was kind of born in 1997. Um, and I, I was an early Amazon and eBay person. I wouldn't say I was totally passionate about it, but then as we started to understand the entrepreneurs that were starting to do this stuff, they really started to like it. And um, a couple things that, that's cool about the retail segment, uh, especially e-commerce, is e-commerce has this really interesting dichotomy where it's super high tech on one side. You know, if, if you think about Amazon and what they've done in cloud computing and had to build, it's it's amazing. You know, complexity from a computation standpoint. We also have this whole thing called, you know, in July your sales are at their lowest, and then Cyber Monday they're their highest. So you have this almost like 100x swing you have to deal with, which is a fun engineering problem. Uh, but then on the other side of e-commerce, someone has to touch the box and ship it, right? So, so there's this whole, you know, fulfillment center part that's like very hands-on and very, you know, you know, dirty. I've got to put this product somewhere and store them and ship them and. You know, they, they, a loading dock is here, and trucks go out there, and I have to work with FedEx and UPS. So that, that's kind of a really interesting part of it um, that, that is in the world of e-commerce. Another thing that's nice about retailers is um, 
So I've sold to developers and retailers, and I know a lot of startups that sell to like doctors and hospitals. And no, no offense, I never want to sell to doctors and hospitals from what I've heard. And I don't want to sell to governments because they seem to like take forever to do stuff. Um, the challenge with selling to developers is a developer, um, there's some developers, especially if they work at big companies, are like, oh yeah, this will save me time, I'll buy it. But most developers look at it and they're kind of like, yeah, I can do better. You know, so they have this not invented here kind of thing. Um, so that was hard selling developer tools because they all felt they could do better and they're, they're not shy about telling you that. Um, then uh, what's nice about retailers is they're kind of in the middle. So um, they, uh, they have a business problem, they don't have a lot of resources, and they have money to invest. So, so we found that they're, a lot, they're good to work with. The only other challenge is they'll always say yes to stuff, but then it's hard to get them to pay and then actually deploy. So um, we had to learn a lot of tricks on that over the years. Oh, go ahead. Scott, you mentioned that you invest a lot of your time on the company culture. What advice would you have for small and growing companies? Yeah, the, the question for the video was, um, you know, company culture and how do you build that? And um, this is a tricky one for me because I'm a, I'm a very sarcastic kind of person. Um, and anyone here watch the movie Office Space? It's like one of my favorite movies, right? So when I was an intern at NCR, uh, I got my badge kind of day two. And on the back was some acronym, and, you know, and it said something like, you know, the company values. And like, number one was don't steal. Number two was like, you know, be nice to your fellow employee. And number three was think about customers. And I was kind of like, you know, wow, this is, you know, do they really have to put this on the badge? You know, who are they hiring here that, you know, I'm like picturing servers walking out of the room and they put that on the badge and finally people are like, oh, don't steal. Okay, I get it now. Um, so, you know, some of the, um, so the thing about culture, I think, is the more you like try to define it, the harder it is to like make it stick in a weird way. So I, I kind of have a, an uncultured kind of mentality. Um, and to me, the best way to do culture and think about it is really, uh, as a leader, is to just kind of you know show show your values and make sure they kind of stick in the company. It gets harder, you know. We have like over 600 employees, so uh, but even to this day, we don't really codify it. Uh, and this drives HR people. I've been through like 300 HR people, VPs of HR, because the first thing they do, I tell them in the interview, I said, don't come in here with an acronym that you want to define our culture against. You know, like we're not going to do SPAT pal, we're not going to take Channel Advisor and make it into an acronym. Uh, or e-com or something, and then like in day three, they're like, I want to talk to you about culture, and I'm like, ah, killing me. Um, so uh, so the more you define it, the, the harder it is to get it right, but it's really kind of how you, you as a leader and a leadership team uh, treat each other and uh, work with each other, and the office space factors into that, and who you hire. Um, the number one thing um, that we, we picked up on, and there's been a lot written about this since we did, is we surveyed employees, we would always say, what do you like and not like? It's kind of like an NPS kind of a question about here. And what we found is people would say, you know, it's not perfect, but I've worked other places where I'm on a team of 10 people and like eight of them are really dumb and, the, and, and one's smart and I just spend all my time and we like pull the team along. But at Channel Advisor, like nine of them are really smart and we really liked that. Um, so we spent a lot of time that, you know, what you find is really top performers like to be with other top performers. So you owe it to them to phase out people that aren't top performers. Um, so that, that's always the hard part of startups, is as you grow, there's gonna be some collateral damage of people that don't grow, grow along with you. Um, and I used to like spend agonizing, sleepless nights over this kind of stuff. But then you know what happened is, we would have to get rid of three or four people, and I'd be on LinkedIn, and like literally eight hours later, they had new jobs. And finally I was like, you know, why am I losing some people? We're, we're in negative unemployment here in the triangle. So, uh, you know, so the good thing is people aren't gonna starve, they're not gonna die. Um, they will find jobs and you know, it's just not a good fit for you and what you're doing. So you actually kind of owe it to them. Many times when you really have these conversations, they know they're not a great fit either. Um, and they, they feel bad that they're not performing to whatever standards you have. So that, that's the number one thing I think we've done a lot of uh, uh, to make sure that we have as many top performers in the company as possible. Cool. That was a long answer, sorry. That's okay. No worries. Um, so you uh, had always wanted to do an IPO, so then you were the CEO of a public company, um, and you talked about what that experience was like initially. Um, but talk about what kind of how your role transformed and, and a little bit more about sort of the, the entrepreneurial bug and how do you know when it's the right time for you to move on, you know? Yeah, and before we went public, we spent a lot of time um, worrying about the company culture because, uh, like you guys, you know, you, you, you have, you, you all sit together and work together, you have almost 100% transparency, right? And as you get bigger, you'll find that transparency starts to kind of go away. It's harder to keep everything going on. Um, and when you go public, there's a big decision you have to make. 
Um, so, uh, you know, it's illegal to trade on insider information. So, if and uh, it's very gray area. So it could almost be that a sales rep knows he's doing really well, buys stock, and that could be considered inside information. So that sales rep could get themselves in trouble through that inside information. So, so you have to make this decision as a company, and there's kind of a very distinct path in the road. One of it is you, you take all the information that could be considered public and you restrict it to a small set of people. And they're in the know, and the other people are not in the know. Um, and you know that, that kind of destroys transparency. Obviously. Or what you do is you say everyone's an insider, and we're going to have these trading windows to protect everybody in the company that you cannot trade until you know, three days after we announce earnings. And then so so we spent a lot of time around that. And also we, we felt like um, it's a huge distraction factor. So you know, we, we said to people, um, and if you do research, I have some charts. For this. So if you do research. Um, so this is a fun stock chart, right? So look at this company. Uh, if you if you were this company and you were in the front end of this curve, it felt good, right? So I think this company IPO'd at a relative two dollars, went to hundred, and then went like to a dollar fifty, right? So that if you're an employee, that's quite a ride because you're like, I'm worth nothing. This is a lottery ticket. Oh my god, I'm a multimillionaire. Oh my god, I just lost multiple millions of dollars. And but what happens is, so it, it, that's the low point. But look what happened to this company later. And this company is Amazon. So every one of the big companies you see today has gone through this. Uh, this is another one. This is they cratered right there. Uh, that's Salesforce.com. So what happened there is oh wait, uh, and then uh, this is another one. This is Google. So that's Facebook. Facebook is actually the most dramatic. This happened in. So they went public and they literally cratered for the next six months. And then now they've come back and are kind of like four x their IPO price. Uh, and then Google the same thing. So, so when you kind of think about going public, we're kind of like, all right, this is going to happen to us because it's happened to everybody. We're going to, we're going to go public, we'll go up, we'll go down, and, and it's going to be a distracting factor. Um, one of the things you do to mitigate that is you start to phase out option plans and you go to restricted stock units, which is a whole fun topic that I can talk about. Um, so that, that helps to some degree, uh, but we spent a lot of time, like a year in front of the IPO, telling people and showing them charts like this and saying, you know, don't get distracted by this, it's going to be kind of crazy. If we focus on building the business, it's the right thing to do. Um, so, so those are the kinds of things we did. Okay, cool. So then, when you uh, two years later, I guess was when you stepped down as the CEO. So, I mean, was it still distracting you, or what was it? The kind of what were you spending your time on by then? Yeah, I don't think the stock price was distracting. I think it's um, so. What happens is you have analysts that follow you, and uh, there's buy side and sell side analysts, and. The sell side analysts are usually from your IPO team, so Goldman Sachs and these kind of people. They put out these reports about your company. So what you do is you do your earnings report, and uh, you know everything you do today is under uh, as a private company is under like a thousand x scrutiny. So before you do your your press release of your earnings, you know literally a team of lawyers and and publicists go over it, and you write this script, and you spend like tons of time. You know a one hour conference call, you probably spend twenty hours on the script, uh, just to make sure you don't. Because what happens is there's always trial lawyers and people out there in these shorts that if you make one slip, they're going to sue the heck out of you and, and that kind of thing. Um, so that, so and then then you announce your earnings and then you have to you do this call and it lasts an hour and you're like great. Uh, and then every analyst wants to talk to you after that. So we have ten analysts. So now you're now you're doing like ten hours of phone calls on that. And then every one of your twenty largest shareholders wants to do a call after you talk to your analysts. So suddenly and then then they want to go on a, a road show to go visit everybody. So what ends up happening is you spend you know, literally 60, 70% of your time on that, um, which I enjoyed it, you know, and, and everything. But then I would always be, you know, kind of in Boston eating a, you know, a salad that looked like it was eight days old, and kind of being like, wow, I wish I'd be talking to a customer right now or working on a new cool feature. Um, so after kind of 18 months of that, I kind of said, I've had about enough of this. So it was a good time for me. And, and you know, what was nice is I had someone that was saying, raising his hand, saying, I want to do that. That sounds awesome to me. I love eight-day-old salads, and it's like a great year. You're the guy. Um, so talk about the, I guess, the wealth creation that happens after something like this for like your team, and what does that mean for the entrepreneurial community? Yeah, I've been, uh, so uh, it's interesting. So in the three companies I had, we still have a nexus of eight or nine people that have been in all three companies. Uh, and those guys have all made mid to high seven figures um, through that kind of journey, which has been good. Um, you know, we spent a lot of time, uh, I was relatively wealthy by the time I was 30, so I had to go through like, how, how do you deal with that? Uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, talking to people that have that. And, you know, it's like lottery ticket winners, you, you see them and they're like, you know, it's this nice little couple from Tennessee and you just know their life can be destroyed in two years. Uh, they'll be flying jets and stuff. Um, 
So, uh, so we, we have created a lot of wealth. We're driving uh, Teslas. Or dri well, you have to have one little, you know, I have one vice outside of Star Wars, and it's, it's my car. Uh, so, uh, so you know, that we spent a lot of time, and we've had a lot of wealth creation. So usually the first 10 to 20 folks have done very, very well. Um, but channel advisor, a lot more folks have done quite well. So, so that's, that's been fun, is to watch people um, you know, do really well that have stuck with us. And also, we've, we've had a number of people leave and start their own companies. So, you know, um, it's always a weird conversation because they expect you to be mad and stuff. And I'm always like, and there's, that's kind of the, the normal, like if you leave IBM, you know, some HR person's going to yell at you and tell you how stupid you are and you're a total idiot and how dare you leave IBM and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I'm always like, you know, you know, thanks for working here for X number of years. We really appreciate it. Go, you know, it would be very critical of me to kind of criticize them for starting a company. It would be like ridiculous. So, um, so, so, you know, we've had a lot of great company people come and work at other startups and that kind of thing. And I'm, I'm totally encouraging it. So do you have any examples of some of the companies that have formed from the channel advisor teams or one of your past companies? We, we actually haven't had that many. For some reason, Bronto has done a great job at that. So, mm -hmm. um, so Bronto's had, um, so Windsor Circle, um, Etail Insights, and a couple others have kind of sprung out of Bronto. So, yeah. um, so that's been an, oh, um, Argyle, which is now uh, mm -hmm. Web Boss. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right, so um, talk about some of the, I know you didn't get to this part of your, in the presentation from what I heard, but um, you're doing some things with drones, you're very interested in 3D printing, um, and the three uh, digital textile printing, things like that. So kind of talk about the different things you're interested in and what you're looking at for like the future of technology, I guess. Yeah, and I started thinking about this, let's see, I'll go back here. So I, I go to all these e-commerce shows, right, and they had Ray Kurzweil speaking. Uh, and I've always read about Ray Kurzweil, he's kind of kooky. He was here uh, last year? Oh, was he? Okay. Did the you Institute for Emerging Issues, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm in the audience, and I'm in with a bunch of retailers, and he starts going into uh, the singularity, which is where there's a point in time where we'll be able to upload our brains into the cloud. And like all the retailers start to leave the room, and I'm kind of like, I'm, you know, the thing, I'm like practically the only guy at this talk. Uh, but what really struck me um, from his talk is um, a chart like this, and uh, so, so we, we as people are very linear creatures, like we're born, we age, and your day is, you know, you get up at X time and you kind of live a linear life. Well, there's a lot of things in mathematics that are logarithmic, and his whole thesis is if you take Moore's Law, it's kind of a logarithmic thing, and it happens so fast that we as linear creatures miss a lot of it. Um, so the way that, that I think most easily it kind of expresses that is this chart. This is the adoption of technologies and how fast it takes. If you look over, I remember when we got our first microwave in my house, and we were like one of the first people in Aiken to have a microwave. And then, you know, what microwaves took 20 years to go from kind of those first houses to 80% saturation. And then you start looking at it, and it accelerates a little bit. Uh, you get to cell phones, and cell phones took kind of 10 years, and then smartphones took five years. Um, uh, one interesting story to kind of tie this together uh, is I mentioned Uber earlier. Um, a guy that used to be a college student that sold on eBay was a Channel Advisor customer. And now he runs Uber New York, and I just met with him yesterday when I was in New York. And um, Uber really launched in 2012, and now everyone's heard the stat, there's more, uh, more Uber drivers than taxi drivers in New York. He said every road in New York is traversed every hour by a and you know, when I, I asked him, you know, could you guys, how hard would it be to build your own mapping software? It's like, you know, it'd actually be pretty trivial because they're like actually mapping out New York every hour. <laughs> so, but, but think of think of like the first time you did Uber, and now it's gotten to that that kind of a level. And I think this is actually exciting for you guys. This is what this means is we've gone from zero to 100 in like literally two or three years, and it's accelerating even faster. Um, and once something gets on Moore's law, it's just off to the races. So, so that got me thinking about, well, how can I kind of think about that, how it impacts retail? Um, because retailers really struggle with this because they've been around for like 150 years. Look at Sears. Sears got totally walloped by all this because they've been 150 years. You know Macy's because it's from your hometown. You know, Macy's is having a really hard time because consumer behaviors are changing every two years, and they're used to like 20-year cycles. They're like, okay, uh, cotton is going to be this exciting new technology. Let's get ready for it. And then now it's just like boom, boom, boom. People want you know a whole different shopping experience. Um, so there's a downside to this, but then the upside is the for you guys that are riding on these platforms, it's pretty amazing. So so some of the things I think that are interesting. Um, one of the things Ray Kurzweil said is 
3D printers in two years will be have all the capability to make more 3D printers. And when that happens, the cost like goes to zero. So you just like have 3D printers making more 3D printers. So that, that's that's pretty wild. Uh, and then the materials are getting better and better. You've seen all the you know printed ear, human tissue, organs, food, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, drones, I think, is interesting because it does impact e-commerce. Uh, whenever I talk to, uh, this kind of got famous, it was Cyber Monday, the night before Cyber Monday in 2013, Amazon was on 60 Minutes, and they unveiled the Charlie Rosa drone. He's like, oh my god, what is it? Um, and um, so Amazon is very serious about this. When I talk to people at Amazon, they're on version like 10 of their drones. They, they see a day when drones will bring stuff to your house. And then when I talk to FedEx, UPS, and retailers, they're like, no way, it'll never happen. Um, so it's really interesting to watch that and the technology's improved. Uh, and then another one that I just like because uh, I like gaming is augmented reality and virtual reality. Um, and I think that will impact things as well. Um, and you, you see Zuckerberg investing multiple billion do dollars to buy Oculus, uh, and that's going to be really interesting. You know? So imagine you know, everyone's going to be sitting in their basement all the time because uh, you won't need to go anywhere because it will be a better experience to do that. Uh, and then you know, they're going to have to shop somehow. So you know, you'll, you'll, you'll go from watching the basketball game and be like, oh, I need uh, you know, a new sweater, and then you'll just start shopping on your Oculus. Have you 3D, 3D printed your own Star Wars characters? I have, yeah. It's kind of dis <laughs> on the maker bot, you know, like all excited and pretty Yoda, and it comes off as kind of trinkety and silly. But um, these dudes uh, that do the more serious stuff, um, they actually just got investment from 3D Systems, who has the Star Wars license. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Wow. Yeah. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes left. Go ahead. I was wondering, you know, hypothetically, how you thought your career, your path might have been different if you were, say, an English major. If you didn't come at it. Hey. Kind of <laughs> <laughs> they still have this? Yeah. You've got a business mind, an eye for opportunity, but you yourself don't have the skills to sit down and start coding. Uh, yeah, so, um, you know, to, to build to build a, a high-tech product, you, you have to have techni technical people and non-technical people. So um, we actually hire a lot of those, and they're pretty integral into this whole thing. And, a really interesting area to think about is what we call product management, and that's kind of, you know, you need a lot of, uh, no offense engineers, a lot of engineers you wouldn't just like parachute in front of a customer because they would be like, you know, you're stupid, well who would ever need that, you know, you could write that in five minutes, so you have to, um, so you're always looking for these people that can kind of be more customer forward. Um, so, so that's where folks with liberal arts degrees are awesome, and they can come in and be salespeople, product management, marketing, um, and help translate what you're doing so that the business owners who may very well be liberal artsy kind of people um, can kind of you know digest that kind of thing. Um, so uh, you know there's a lot of them on founding teams as well that come up with great ideas. So you know, it, it doesn't take you don't have to be an engineer to see a problem uh, and, and try to fix it. Uh, now it's harder if you don't know how to code to kind of go see a problem and fix it, but you can partner with a co-founder that you, you can be the guy that kind of figures out the problem and the business opportunity and then have a co-founder that, that codes. I've, I've been fortunate to kind of have, we're both coders, so, and I've had to stop, you know, I haven't written code in like 15, 20 years, so, um, for all intents and purposes, it just, it does allow me to keep people honest, you know, to say to the database guy, is that really gonna take a week? You know, it's just a table. And then it almost becomes a joke at this point, so. Anyone else? Any, um, so the tweener list, which has been quite the effort, um, anything you've seen and sort of uh, some things that have revealed about this region as a result of that list and the companies that are scaling faster and on, that have made it that you would want to say? Yeah, and um, so you know, having been here for 20 years doing startups, one thing that always agitates me is everyone wants us to be like the next Silicon Valley. And has everyone seen the TV show Silicon Valley? Um, you have to watch that. If, uh, so I deal a lot with those folks out there, and they're exactly like that. I mean, it's like it's amplified a little bit, but not 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 terribly. Um, so you know, there's this whole bro culture and this whole thing, GamerGate and all this mess that you read about on TechCrunch and stuff like that. We don't have any of that here. Um, also, there's a lot of backstabbing. You know, you'll you'll go out there, and, and uh, the entrepreneurs have to be very careful. They don't meet out kind of in the open a lot of times because there's all these ideas getting stolen and backstabbing and things. Um, so, so what I love about our region that I think we need to be kind of you know, the triangle and not the next Silicon Valley. I want to be like you know the the next awesome tech thing that has our own culture. Um, so we have an open environment where we share um, 
you know, we, we have the flavor of the three cities, which is kind of cool. So, you know, uh, you know that, that gives you a lot of choices uh, about where you're going. Um, in this latest list, we added a bunch of female entrepreneurs, which I think is amazing. So I think we're up to like eight or 10. Um, yeah, it's yeah. about eight, nine percent or something. Yeah. That were women founders. Which, you know, it'd be great to have more, but I think that we over indexed to like Silicon Valley or something. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I think is we have a lot of bootstrap companies here. So if you look at like the Brontos and all these companies, um, yeah, it's pretty amazing to, to build a company and sell it for two hundred million dollars. Um, I think their revenues are twenty to thirty million bootstrap. And that's you know there, there's something to be said for that. There's you know uh, I've done both and bootstrapping's harder. Um, <laughs> let me tell you. Uh, but you know the best capital from is the capital you get from a customer. And if you can do that, then you the entrepreneur don't have to share with anyone, which is which is kind of amazing. Now VCs don't are hugely popular about that model, but that's you know if you can do it, it's great. So I think that's what really sets us apart is, is that. All right, let's take this last question. Uh, it's great to hear about and be among all of the creativity and entrepreneurship and just constant invention. Um, I'm curious about the intersection of all of this and this growth and community change or social change or social issues. And we see how things are happening with in education and infusion of ideas. It's sort of being blown apart without that cohesive view. But do you see in your experience, have you said, okay, how do we turn what we're doing in this innovation toward the community and solving social problems? Or is that, that that's for the Triangle Community Foundation or something else? Yeah, and um, so what's tricky is when you go raise venture capital, you know, what you don't, what VCs don't want you to do is go give a million dollars to your favorite foundation, right? So, um, so I, I kind of think it's, it ends up being in, in that kind of a business. It ends up being a personal thing that you do, and probably not within the business. That being said, if someone, you know, we have groups at Channel Advisor that love to volunteer, they self-organize and go do that, and that's great, and we support it. Um, but even as a public company, you know, you don't want to kind of say, well, we, should, we could have made our earnings number, but we gave 500K to this awesome charity. So there's, there's definitely a misalignment with that and the, the, you know, the raising venture capital and being a public company. Um, but what's really interesting is this, you know, the, the millennial generation is very, very focused on this, and many of their companies have it as part of their core competency to kind of, um, you know, go solve a social problem while building the business. So a lot of the things in the education space have an element of that. Um, uh, you know, a good example is um, Justin at, uh, it'll come to me. So there's a guy in, Dur in Chapel Hill, he's very passionate about teaching youth digital, teaching young people to code. So he's built a business around that, and then he's giving away, you know, he, he gives away his software and sells it. And so there's a lot of interesting ways to do that. Um, I've never happened on one. Um, so, you know, it it's definitely is an element of many startups. So. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you guys so much. Scott, will you hang around for a few sure. minutes if anyone Absolutely. wants to ask him any questions? And um, let me know if other people that you might like to have up here. Um, we are doing the Help Fest every couple of months, um, exit events. So we can bring in people from all over the region um, that you want to hear from. So just let me know. Thank you.